definitely need to look at work hour limitations. Uh, today is is not like a. Uh, you know, if this were game day, it wouldn't be quite the so same. So actually, how how far off? Those are other pressures on the time list. I'm not sure we want to keep that hour in your game. That's something we're going to have to talk about.
Four, three, two, one. Give another two seconds. Yeah. In the front. Yeah. In the front. Oh, oh baby, right. go get out of here! Oh, we tore it. Dang it. Tore the shoot? Yep. Yeah. Big, the shoot. Big, big rip. Okay, that's what we need to see. Burn out. Burn out. Burn out. Nice job, girls. That was both stages, right? Yep. yep. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Oh. All right. There you go. C1Q, the launch release squib command. GSE2, open the helium valve. GSE2Q, the primary terminate command. Collar. In the background here we have our launch tower. We launch a large scientific balloon, a 34 million cubic foot helium balloon that carries our 7,000 pound test vehicle up to 120,000 feet in the atmosphere.
That vehicle has on it a large rocket motor, which then fires and takes the vehicle even higher, up to 160 to 180,000 feet, where the atmosphere is like it is at Mars, where we'd use these decelerators. And then it's going about sideways. We deploy at Mach 4 our first decelerator, what's called our SIAD, our supersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator. It's a large tube that inflates around the vehicle. That slows it down to Mach 2.5. And at Mach 2.5, we deploy a large 30 meter parachute. Those are the two technologies that we're testing. So we're doing this test to see what could possibly go wrong. And we expect that there may be some things that go wrong. These sorts of failures are why, why we're doing this test. This is a shakeout test to see if we can get the vehicle up to the proper conditions. We're taking all the measurements we need and getting all the data back that we can get to see how it works and to learn from that. Those lessons learned will be applied to the two flights that we have next year to actually test these technologies, the inflatable and the parachute. So my boss told me that if this thing works perfectly, if it does exactly what we expected it to do, it exactly hits the targets that we want, it flies the way we want, it gets the data back exactly like we want, all the cameras work, all of that, then I get an A. But if we have some failures, if we have some problems, if we see things that we learn from that we can apply to the next flight, then I get an A+. So what we're really doing, right, is engineering the new entry, descent, and landing technologies for the future. What we've used to date, um, it was really developed back in the 1960s and the 1970s and was used in the Viking landing back in the mid-70s as, as the first time that we landed on Mars. We, can own, we, we have utilized as best we can what we learned from those entry, descent, and landing techniques. And now we need to go above and beyond that. And that's why we got to invest in these technologies today. If we're going to get to Mars, and we are, then we need to be able to figure out how to fly through that atmosphere. So when Curiosity landed on Mars, that was a metric ton. It's a, about the size of a Mini Cooper uh, car. And that is the most mass we can put on the surface of Mars today. That is tricking out every technique we have in entry, descent, and landing to get to Mars, a metric ton. If we're going to really explore Mars in any earnest way, with bigger and better systems, with humans and cargoes, by some studies, we need something on the order of a two-story house to be able to land on Mars. Well, when we develop technology, uh, failure in our testing, failure in our work is always a possibility. Uh, in fact, some would argue in technology development that uh, if you don't push the boundary a little bit, that uh, again, the appropriate, appropriate amount of failure is, is actually something you need in the program, right? In fact, risk intolerance is actually a guarantee of failure. You will never learn. So we have to take the right amount of risk. We do the right calculations, we do good engineering, but we are pushing the boundaries of these technologies. If we want to land bigger things, bigger, more capable rovers that can drive further, and we want to land them at altitudes that we haven't been able to reach before, to explore new regions of Mars, and we want to be able to land them more accurately so we can focus some of the exploration, we need new technologies to do that. And it's not just for the science that we have, but also for the long-term vision of eventually being able to put humans and people on the surface of Mars. So we're developing new technologies to what we call inflatable aerodynamic decelerators, or supersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerators, SIADs for short. Uh, these are devices that are deployed at around 4,000 miles an hour uh, to increase the size of the aeroshell as it enters Mars' atmosphere. We're also developing a new parachute that would be used at Mars, a much bigger parachute that would produce two and a half times the drag of any parachute used previously on Mars at conditions um, much higher, much more difficult than previously would have been attainable. So what we're going to do is take this aeroshell, we're going to hoist it to an altitude using a very large balloon that's the size of the Rose Bowl. Uh, the balloon will carry this to about 120,000 feet. It will release this test vehicle. The test vehicle will have a, a large solid rocket attached to it that will accelerate it to 
4,000 miles an hour and a little bit higher in altitude so that we get that environment, that test condition that would be very similar to how the devices would be used at Mars. And it's in that environment and in that state that we begin deploying these devices. And it's the testing of the devices that gives us confidence that we'll be able to work at Mars and that they'll perform the way that we expect them to perform.